right, well, good evening. It is officially seven o'clock. And so let's kick it off here. Again, welcome to our Clean and Working for Clean and Healthy Lakes webinar series. Uh, this is the fourth and final webinar in this series uh, this summer. Um, I'm sure we're going to repeat a series like this uh, next summer um, because it's been so popular. But again, tonight we're gonna learn about loons. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping uh, before we turn it over to our experts here. Um, this session is being recorded. Uh, participants, we will have you on mute for the duration of the this session. Again, with 100, 150 of us, um, that'd be quite a party if we were all uh, chatting away. You are welcome to leave your camera on. Just remember if you do, others can see you. Feel free to submit questions or comments in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. Um, and Crystal and I and Jessica will be joining us later. We'll be uh, trying to answer your questions as best we can, but we're not the experts and we will save those quest questions we don't know um, for the experts at the end. After this session, you will receive an email uh, this evening um, asking you to evaluate the session. What'd you like, what you didn't like, and what about, what do you wanna learn in future sessions? If you're having technical difficulties, uh, do try to chat, ch type that into the chat box and Crystal or someone in the audience or myself will try to help you. So your host this evening again, I'm Andrea Lamro, Vice President of New Hampshire Lakes. Uh, Crystal Costa Balanoff, our Conservation Program Coordinator is with us tonight. And Jessica Sayers, our Conservation Program, Coordin uh, Program Assistant will likely be tuning in later. She's on a different webinar right now, learning about Squam Lake and the great work they're doing up there. So New Hampshire Lakes, for those of you who are members and who support us, thank you. Thank you for your membership and your support. Um, because of you and your support, we are able to provide uh, opportunities like this. Uh, we work for all of New Hampshire's 1,000 lakes. If you're not a member, please do consider uh, becoming a member or making a donation today at our website. Um, again, um, your support makes all of this possible. Our mission, simply put, is to keep our lakes clean and healthy now and in the future. And we work with partners, partners like the Loon Preservation Committee, to promote clean water policies and wise use of our lakes and simply to inspire the public to care for our lakes and, and all the critters like loons uh, that need and depend on our lakes. Our programs, we do advocacy at the state level. Um, we've involved in advocacy issues for the protection of loons. We do conservation. You, if you know us, you know us probably through our Lake Coast Courtesy Boat Inspection Program. And we do outreach, usually a lot of outreach in the summer to families and kids throughout the state at festivals, but we're not really doing that this year. But sort of a happy um, result of this is that we're now doing a whole bunch of webinars. And um, I just wanted to say, based on popular demand, we're actually kicking up another webinar series in August. So stay tuned for a, an email about that. But without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Caroline Hughes, um, Outreach Volunteer Coordinator and with the Loon Preservation Committee and Harry Vogel, Senior Biologist and Executive Director of the Loon Preservation Committee. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and then Harry, you should be able to um, share yours. I believe you're going first here. Great, okay, and let me, I'm gonna do that right away. All right. Okay. And we see it, looks Is everybody good. Everybody see it, great. See, that's working well so far. Good, all right. So, um, well, Andrea, first of all, let me start by, by saying uh, thank you for doing this series and, and, um, and for having us on as well. And it is great to hear uh, about all the good work that New Hampshire Lakes is, is doing. Um, and we really value our relationship as you, as you know, and as many other people will know, we worked very closely on lead um, and, and, um, and, you know, most recently on wake boats and the commission and, and things of that nature. Um, and it's great. I just think the environmental community in New Hampshire is small but active. And I love the fact that we support each other in the work that we do and we're all working together um, to, to accomplish what we can for our wildlife. And so uh, this is great. And let me, um, so let me start and see, ta-da, look at this, it's working. Um, so, 
Uh, I'd like to do a couple of things uh, this evening. First of all, just talk about loons and threats to loons. Um, and uh, and after that, you know, people are going to be tired of hearing from me, so I'm going to hand it over to Caroline to talk about the Loon Preservation Committee and the work that we are doing to preserve loons here in the that's awesome. We love the, no the the music and the loons, Harry. If there's any way to maybe turn it down a bit, um, that what, that might yeah. be helpful for Fantastic. some, like let me. Let me try. <laughs> let me see about doing that. I'm going to hope that this will actually um, work. Is that helpful? Okay, I'm going to hope. And I will talk loud um, <laughs> over, over top of the loop. So, um, Good. Let me start by uh, by introducing a, uh, a loon researcher extraordinaire, Judy McIntyre. Um, Judy was really one of the first people to look in depth at loons and people and the interactions between those two species. She did her PhD work on loons way back in 1975. There's been a lot of great work done on loons since then, but much of it harkens back to that pioneering work that she did. And in addition to being a great researcher, Judy was also a little bit of a philosopher. And so Judy referred to loons and their calls as a symbol of wilderness and the positive affirmation of wild things and wild places and wild sounds in the night. And loons have really have come to typify the nature experience for a lot of outdoors. And there are good reasons for them. So these are impressive birds, right? And so one of the first things that we hear from people who are coming into the Loon Center and seeing our taxidermy loons, they say, oh, I had no idea that they were so big. And a full-grown male loon in New Hampshire can get up to 15, sometimes 16 pounds in size. Uh, they have a striking black and white plumage. They have these blood red eyes. They have these distinctive and far-ranging calls. And in fact, my very favorite loon quote comes from a British researcher who way back in the 1950s described the nighttime calling of loons as a chorus from all of the devils in town. So whether you love those sounds or they send chills up and down your spine, you're not likely to forget them or the bird that moves. Harry, I hate to interrupt you. That yeah. noise was lovely, but we were getting some feedback in the chat box that folks couldn't hear you. <laughs> okay. So let me, let me try. All right. Absolutely. So let me try. I'm going to decrease the sound on here a little bit. Um, and, and I will crowd in closer to this and I'll speak louder. Oh, it's still, it's still very loud, Harry. Are you playing it from a video or uh, is it an audio tract that can be independently turned so, down? So, do you know what? What I could, what I could do, I mean, we try and, and provide folks with a, with a beautiful audio visual experience. Um, but if it's interfering with things, I wonder how I go back and cut out the sound from this. Settings. No. Okay. In terms of my screen sharing. Huh. Let me see. You may be able to mute the presentation, although it'll be a shame to not be able to hear it. I hope that we can just turn it down. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, how do I go about settings? Now we're playing these things. Speaker, microphone. Yeah, we don't want to. We don't want to lose our ability to hear you. So yeah. um, you may. You may want to back out of your presentation itself just for a yep. moment and then actually right. turn down the computer audio. Let me stop screen sharing then and what I will do is try and begin screen sharing again and this time do it without the audio. No share computer screen and then share. Okay, that should have solved this problem. We'll see. Is that sounding better for folks? Well, we don't hear anything, but we can hear you. And I think everybody wants to hear you. Um, so right. we're more in the loss of the, of the I, loon I calls. They were to, beautiful. Right? I hate to drown out those beautiful calls, but um, here, here we are. And so, um, good. All right. So um, to continue where we left off. So, they, so the calls, sadly, that you're not hearing now are an important part of that loon experience. Uh, even without those, 
if you add a downy chick, you know, to those, um, to a pair of loons on the lakes, and you've hooked a fair proportion of your loon uh, watching population. So even people who are not bird watchers, right, who don't know the difference between a house finch and a house sparrow, they know and love their loons, and that makes loons a powerful force for conservation. So this is not a loon. So this is a duck, male common merganser to be exact. Um, every year we get reports, you know, of a loon with, uh, with four or eight or 12 little chicks behind it. And we have to tell, you know, our, our volunteers, well, that's probably not a loon that you saw because a loon will have really only one or two chicks. That's going to be a merganser or some other uh, uh, bird. Sometimes, of course, people get very irate when they hear that and they say, now look, you know, we've been living in the lakes region all of our lives. We know a loon when we see a loon. And that was a loon with a dozen little chicks, you know, behind it. And when that happens, we, we thank these folks for their um, reports and then we quietly vertical file those and don't go back um, to, those, uh, to those reports again. But I can see how people can misidentify loons and, and um, for instance, a merganser because in many ways they are similar. You know, they're black and white birds, they dive, they come up with fish. Several key differences though, mergansers, uh, not even half the size, you know, of one of our male loons, so a much smaller bird. Uh, they sit much higher out of the water. They're showing a lot of white along the sides. They don't have that checkerboard pattern along the back. And then there's that bill, which is bright red, instead of, you know, very dark gray or black along the nose. So loons are not ducks, not even closely related to ducks. And in fact, the fastest way to annoy a loon researcher is to refer to a loon as a duck or waterfowl because they are neither of those two things. So if loons are not ducks, um, then what are they? And where do these loons fit in with other birds? So sometimes people are surprised, you know, to find that one of the closest living relatives of our loons are penguins. So in this case, we see beautiful emperor penguin here. Uh, and again, some people say, well, the color scheme seems pretty similar. They're, they have that formal black and white thing going. Obviously, though, significant differences between a penguin and a loon. One of the chief ones, of course, is that our penguins are flightless. And so those wings of penguins have been modified so much that they're no good at all for moving penguins through the air, um, but they use those for swimming. So these penguins are actually flying underwater even that is very different from our loons, you know, which use their big webbed feet and not their wings to get around underwater. The topper for me, though, is that penguins are entirely a bird of the southern hemisphere, whereas loons are found only north of the equator. So we probably do have to go back a fairer ways in time to find a common ancestor of these two groups of birds. And the story gets even stranger because the other closely related group of birds are the tube-nosed swimmers, and those are the albatrosses, the petrels, and the shearwater. So here is a wandering albatross, and, and here is this graceful soaring bird that spends most of its life in the air riding those ocean currents. And I'm trying to, to tell you good viewers that they're actually fairly closely related to our stubby-winged little loons that can barely seem to take off from the surface of the water. But genes don't lie. And you know, way back now in 1983, Sibley and Alquist, a couple of, uh, of geneticists, did an assay of all of the living groups of birds. And what they found is that these three groups of birds, the loons, the penguins, the tube-nosed swimmers, grouped out fairly close to each other and fairly distinct from these other lines of birds. And there's one other thing, you know, that makes us feel a little bit better about this unlikely grouping of birds, and that's a lifestyle characteristic. Uh, and, and that's the ocean. And so uh, uh, many of us think of loons as freshwater birds that happen to go to the ocean to overwinter. It's just as correct, maybe more correct, to think of loons as ocean birds that come to freshwater only to breed. So I'll talk a little bit more about the lifestyle of, uh, of loons. So loons, diving, fish-eating birds. Um, if anybody has spent any time in a lake, there'll be another fish eating bird they're very familiar with, a great blue heron. Herons and, and loons, both eating fish, they do it in very different ways. And so a great blue heron does its, it's an ambush predator, classic. And so it does its best to imitate a tree, stands very still, waits for a fish or a crayfish or a frog to swim by, and then snatches it up. Loons, in contrast, are very active predators. 
surface. And so a loon will um, peer under the surface of the water or while it's down there diving, if it sees a fish, it will actually give chase to that fish and, and try and cut that fish off and swallow it. And so sometimes people will ask me what the favored food of a loon is. And, um, you know, loons have very, turns out they have very few taste buds. So there's no real evidence that they are selecting their fish based on any kind of a taste preference. Typically, I think it's the fish themselves that determines whether or not they're caught. Because uh, if a loon is chasing, you know, a trout or a landlocked salmon, any of these fusiform, the torpedo-shaped fish, the cold water species, um, their method of escaping loon, uh, um, or any other predator really, is to put on a burst of speed and head straight down to the deep um, part of the lake. And they are, so, they are so fast that they can actually outswim a loon and a loon can't follow them, it will lose them. But any of our, our warm water species, and that includes the yellow perch or a sunfish, a smallmouth bass, uh, their method of escaping from a loon or another predator is to zigzag like crazy at the surface of the water. And, and um, loons are so maneuverable that every time those little fish zig or zag, a loon can cut the corner until it's close enough to grab it and, and swallow it. Typically, those um, fish are swallowed underwater. A couple of exceptions to that. If a loon um, picks up a, a horn pout, a catfish, those are pretty spiny. They want to make sure that those go down the right way. Um, and so they will often bring those to the surface to manipulate them and make sure they're going down head first. And this loon is probably on its way to feed this fish to one of its chicks. So here's a, a shot of a loon swimming underwater. These are awfully hard to, to get. The slide is a little bit dark, but I, I wanted to show this to give you a sense of a couple of adaptations of loons that make them these specialized diving fish eating birds. And so the first is pretty obvious, and that is that the legs of this bird are exiting um, the body right at the very back of the body. So all wrong for walking, the center of gravity is all off, but it makes them incredibly efficient swimmers. And they can move through the water almost like the torpedo. The second thing that you can't really see from the slide is that the bones of loons are very dense. And so um, some people, in fact, will say, oh, well, loons have solid bones. And I've even seen this written up in books. Actually not true. The bones are not solid, but they're much more thick walled, much more dense than the bones of other flying birds. And uh, if any of you have ever tried to dive under the surface of the water wearing water wings or any kind of flotation that works by, uh, by trapping bubbles of air, you know that that's not a great strategy if you want to spend any amount of time under the water. So those dense bones and that generally heavy body helps loons achieve kind of a neutral buoyancy in the water and helps them stay underwater for long periods of time, whether they're traveling or chasing fish with a minimum of effort. Here's another view of a swimming loon. So I show this just to show folks that the wings of this bird are held up tight, right up against the body. Um, and so wings of loons are actually a bit of a detriment when they're underwater. All they do is create a little bit of extra drag. So that for, for that reason, wings of loons are actually very small in relation to their body size and, and body weight. And that combination of small wings and heavy body means that loons have a very high wing loading. So essentially what this means is that every square inch of a loon's wing has to hold aloft more body weight than almost any other flying bird. In fact, loons have the second highest wing loading of any flying bird in North America. They're second only to the swans. And that means uh, that you'll often see this, a long running start across the surface of the water to get enough airflow over those little wings to lift that heavy body off of the water. So in a dead calm day, uh, a loon can run, uh, have to, may have to run up to a quarter of a mile to become air. Here's another shot of a loon taking off. Um, sometimes on a smaller lake, people will notice that loons will take off and they'll do one or two circuits around the lake before they end up flying off in, in one direction or another. And that's not a scenic tour on the part of that uh, loon. Every circuit helps it gain a few precious feet of altitude until it can clear the trees at the water's edge. Once these birds are up uh, and in the air, their flight is swift and direct. Flying loon will beat its wings four times a second, um, and that is enough to help them reach and maintain a speed of up to 80 miles an hour in level flight. In fact, there's a couple of, of uh, pieces of hunter folklore 
uh, that date back to the late 1800s. One is that um, if you were hunting loons and, um, and you shot at a loon that was just happily floating on the surface of the water, the loon could see the flash from your rifle and slip under the waves before the bullet reached it. The other is that a flying loon, if it was flying away from you, you could shoot at that loon, but your shot wouldn't overtake the loon. And I think a lot of loons lost their lives testing those theories, um, and thankfully we don't do that anymore. So those legs placed right at the very, very back of the body mean that loons are almost helpless on land. They really can't walk at all. Um, a loon kind of pushes, can push itself along on its front and it can balance uh, for short periods of time uh, to create or tend a nest or to roll eggs as this one to the right is probably doing. And that's one reason why a, loon, uh, a loon's nest is always right next to the water. So those nests can be uh, pretty elaborate structures made of piled up mud and vegetation like this one. Or they can be just a shallow scrape in the sand and they can be right out in the open like this one is. Or they can be quite well hidden. So most of us don't think of this black and white speckling on the back of a loon or for that matter the, the necklace or the chin strap markings as camouflage. But if a loon is nesting under vegetation that allows only dappled sunlight to, to reach it and the, uh, and the surface of the nest, it can actually work pretty well to break up the outline of that bird on the nest. Two eggs are typically laid on the nest. Um, these eggs are olive colored with black spots um, and that's, that serves them very well as camouflage against that nest material. That's important because at the beginning of incubation and certainly up until the, the second egg is laid, um, loons can often just leave that nest untended for hours at a time. As soon as that second nest is laid though, they begin to get more serious about incubation. And by the end of incubation, they're spending about 99% of their time on that nest, sitting on that nest. A little bit larger than a chicken egg, as you can see. I always say it'd probably make a heck of an omelet, but we do not do that at the Loon Center either. And both parents uh, share in all aspects of chick rearing. And that includes making the nest, it includes incubating eggs, it includes feeding and caring for the chicks. So incubation times can vary pretty widely from pair to pair, but when there's a nest exchange and usually in between nest exchanges as well, the adults will take those opportunities to get up and roll those eggs. And rolling those eggs allows fresh oxygen in, it flushes bad gases out, and it actually keeps the embryo from sticking to uh, the egg roll. Then after about 27 or 28 days, if all has gone well, we have our first chick. Um, if the loons do lay two eggs, and usually they do, those are laid more or less two or two and a half days apart. Uh, the chicks, once they uh, are hatched, stay, will stay on the nest until they're dry and sometimes overnight. After that second chick hatches though, the whole family takes to the water, usually pretty quickly. So here, uh, a pair of newborn chicks in their first coat of very dark, almost black down. So as you can see, um, the chick here in front is not gonna be flying anytime soon. Those wing buds are, are uh, not at all developed, but those legs and feet are ready for action. And these chicks can swim as soon as they're born. And despite that, you'll often see this, a couple of chicks riding up on the back of a parent. Um, we think there are a couple of reasons to do this. And one is that cold water can suck heat out of a tiny body very quickly. And so um, this probably helps loons to, these loon chicks to thermoregulate, to maintain a constant uh, body temperature. And the other thing is that an awful lot of things will eat a loon chick if they can get it. So that includes eagles flying over, but it also includes snapping turtles, even a large fish. Um, under the surface of the water. So overall, it's probably the safest place for these chicks to be. The chicks grow very rapidly. These are about two weeks old. They've already lost that first coat of very dark down. They've molted now into their second coat of down, which is kind of a light um, brown gray in color. At seven weeks, that second coat of down is now molting. And you can see on the, the back of the left-hand loon, uh, we see these uh, little scalloped appearance. So these are the juvenile feathers that are beginning to grow out. These are the feathers that will um, give shape and contour to the body. They allow for longer dives. Eventually they will allow for flight as well. 
and then here we are, Luna, 10 weeks, you know, and, and at this point it looks um, pretty much like our majestic loons, at least in, in, um, in profile. Um, this bird is going to look essentially this way for the next two years. It's about 26 months of, of age when loons first molt out of this basic plumage into uh, their black and white plumage, which we actually call the alternate or the breeding plumage of loons. At 10 weeks, the flight feathers have grown in, um, but their flight muscles, you know, are still developing, so they're not actually fledged yet. And by this time, chicks are pretty much able to catch their own food, but it's still easier to beg from your parents for a little while longer if you can. And then by 12 or 13 weeks, um, these birds are flying. So at that point, we consider them to be fledged. They will take small flights around their lake, maybe even visiting other neighboring lakes. But for the rest of the summer, um, these birds are really, um, you know, the natal lake, the lake on which they were hatched is their home. That's where their parents are. They know where the good fishing spots are. They know where some of the challenges on that lakes are. So they stay pretty close to that lake uh, throughout that first summer. And then by fall, you know, as the leaves are turning, uh, these chicks are pretty much fully grown. They're just about the same size as the adults. The adults at this point are molting from their alternate plumage back into that drab gray winter or basic plumage, and it can actually be hard to tell them apart. So the needs of loons are pretty simple when you think about it. Loons are diving, fish-eating birds, so they need um, cool and clear water to catch the fish that they eat, and they need quiet places to be able to incubate those eggs and to raise their young. And it's when one or more of those things are missing that loons run into trouble. So the large lakes that loons claim as breeding territories are also the endpoints for many of our toxins. And one toxin that we at the Loon Preservation Committee have had our eyes on for a long time now is mercury. Turns out that our loons here in the Northeast have the highest levels of mercury uh, of any loons in the United States. And that's as measured in both unhatched eggs from failed loon nests, those are the green bars, and also the blood of live um, captured loons, and those are the yellow or gold bars. So where does this mercury come from? So um, mercury is a naturally occurring element. So it's present in minute quantities pretty much everywhere. Uh, and that means that it's also present in coal. But the mercury that is present in that coal is bound up in that coal and it's sequestered below the surface of the earth where it can't do much harm to living things. Um, and that's true until we mine that coal and bring it up to the surface and burn it to create electricity. Because mercury is an element, it's hard to destroy. It survives that combustion process. It goes up the smokestack and then it comes right back down into our lakes and ponds. So mercury is also the only metal that is a liquid at room temperature. And therefore it has some unique properties that have made it very useful in things like thermometers and electrical switches and compact fluorescent light bulbs um, uh, and many other you know, consumer goods. And when those goods have lived out their useful purposes, if we dispose of them incorrectly by simply throwing them away into the garbage, um, they end up in a landfill or even worse, in an incinerator and again, up the smokestack and then right back down. So the areas in New Hampshire, and these are the areas in the orange and the red on that map, where we have seen the highest levels of mercury in our loons are all downwind from either coal fire power plants or municipal waste incinerators. And this is important because mercury is a potent neurotoxin. As little as a 1.3 parts per million of mercury can kill an embryo developing inside of a loon egg. And we've pulled eggs off of some lakes in New Hampshire that are getting up into the four parts per million um, uh, range for mercury. So we do know that this is something affecting our loons. And happily, those, those um, mercury levels we're seeing are coming down, you know, as we're putting scrubbers on smokestacks, as we're getting better about recycling and, and, um, and carefully disposing of items that include mercury. Another problem is shoreline um, development and things that go with shoreline development. So um, loons love to nest on islands. We humans also love to nest on islands or otherwise alter natural areas of shoreline. And when we do that, we can displace these loons from their traditional historical nesting sites. 
And since Lynn's nest by the water, they can get into trouble when we move the water. So drawdowns for flood control uh, or power production can strand a loon nest uh, out of the reach of these loons. Simply sometimes too high and too far to go over a muddy, rocky bottom for them to get back to that nest. The opposite can also happen if water level rises or even the wake from large power boats going too fast, too close to a loon nest, can actually swamp loon uh, nests and sometimes they can even wash out a loon egg. The close approach of boats can flush an incubating loon from a nest. Um, if this happens to you, if you uh, accidentally come around a corner and surprise a loon and it flushes off the nest, the good news is if you leave that area right away, then the chances are pretty good that that loon's gonna hop back on in 20 or 30 minutes. The danger is if it's a hot day, those eggs can cook in the heat. If it's a cold day, they can chill. Either one of those can, can kill the embryo developing inside of that egg. Um, and in any case, that nest is now open uh, to anything that's working its way along the shoreline or flying overhead and looking for an easy meal. And a lot of animals will take loon eggs if they can get it. So that includes raccoons and minks. Those are probably most often responsible for the majority of, of uh, mammal predations of nests. But any of the scavenging animals, that includes foxes, skunks, bears, coyotes, um, will take a loon egg if they can get it on an untended nest. And crows and gulls and eagles will also take loon eggs. Uh, eagles will also take loon chicks if they can get them. Uh, and they've even been known to take an adult loon from time to time. And that is more common out in the Midwest where their loons are only about a half to two thirds the size of our big New England loons out here. But as eagle predations have been uh, increasing much more rapidly than loon populations, it's becoming more of an issue here in New Hampshire as well. And loons, you know, have lived with predators throughout their long history. But today, some of those populations of predators, I'm thinking more of raccoons and, and gulls and crows, for example, um, have risen to unnaturally high levels because of their ready access to human garbage. Uh, and then that in turn puts um, pressure on our native wildlife. So once hatched, loon chicks are not out of danger either because these chicks are small and they're dark and they're too buoyant to easily dive away from approaching boats. And so every year we lose a number of these to collisions with power boats and jet skis. And boats that get too close to loon families can also impede uh, the parental care and feeding of young. So I like to say that it's a full-time job for two loons to raise two chicks over the course of a summer and we need to give them the space uh, to do that. The problem, of course, is that once these chicks hatch, they act as a magnet to people. So we all wanna get just a little bit closer to those chicks and get a good look at that loon family and share in that intimate experience, maybe get a picture or two. And the problem is that when we crowd in too close to those loons, they stop doing what they're doing, which is what they need to be doing, which is you know, guarding and, and feeding those chicks and they begin to concentrate on us instead as a potential predator that's getting uncomfortably, uncomfortably close to their family. And if we continue to get close to them, they may turn around and, and begin to swim away. And so what do we do? Well, we paddle a little bit harder, right, to get back, you know, in close proximity um, to them. Um, and so we really do need to give these birds a little bit of, of the space that they need uh, to be able to do the things that they do. And those are really the reasons why we're wanting to watch them in the first place as they carry about their, their normal activities. Every once in a while, we have somebody come into the Loon Center uh, and they say, oh, the loons were dancing for us. And I'm always surprised that people don't recognize this is a sign of an animal in great distress. So this is a distraction display that's meant to distract our attention away from a mate or uh, their chicks or, or a loon nest. And these displays take time and energy away from feeding and caring for themselves and feeding and caring for those chicks. Um, and really, these loons need to be spending their energy in, in other ways to, um, other than displaying for our benefit. So loons and other wildlife can uh, become entangled in monofilament line um, that is cast overboard. 
Uh, loons have no opposable thumbs, so if they find themselves tangled up in line, their method of trying to untangle themselves is often to try and work it out of their body with their bill. And sadly, we have seen um, loons with their bills entirely wired shut with line. And if we can't catch these birds and rescue them, they can actually die from a combination of starvation and exposure. So a lot of issues, a lot of challenges facing these loons, none bigger than this one. So lead fishing tackle is a huge problem for our loons. And when we talk about fishing tackle, we're talking about either a sinker, you know, that you can crimp onto a line or tie onto a line, or what we see in this picture, which is a, a fishing jig. And that is simply a sinker that has the hook molded right into it so that the hook and the sinker are, are both kind of integral and it's a one piece of, of tackle. So loons can ingest tackle, whether it's sinkers and jigs, in a few different ways. Uh, loons have no teeth, so they have to swallow their fish whole. And after they swallow a fish, they will forage along the bottom of the lake. And they're looking for little pebbles that they can pick up um, and, and swallow. And once they swallow those pebbles, they, instead of passing them through, they hold those in the gizzard, the muscular portion of their stomach, and they use those as surrogate teeth to help grind up that fish that they have just eaten. And so that is something that has served loons well throughout their long history. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the, these tiny little split shot sinkers that you can crimp onto a line are about the same size and shape as those little pebbles they're looking for. And they can easily swallow a lead split shot while they're looking to ingest some of those small pebbles. We used to think that that was the major way in which loons were ingesting um, lead tackle and subsequently dying of lead poisoning. But we now think that there are two other ways that um, loons can ingest this, which are actually more common. So uh, it's, um, the second way, a, a typical loon prey item might be a six or an eight inch yellow perch, but on occasion, loons can capture uh, larger fish. And once you're talking about a fish that's larger than an eight inch yellow perch, you're beginning to talk about a fish that could conceivably break an angler's line. And, and once that line is broken, chances are it's still gonna be trailing a lead sinker or a lead headed jig as well as that line. That fish is gonna be a little bit slower than the fish next to it. It's gonna be behaving a little bit erratically and just naturally that is the fish that a loon is gonna zero in on as an easy meal. When it gets the fish, it gets the hook and the line and the sinker or the jig as well. Um, and then finally, if you're fishing, of course, you're trying to catch a fish, but you could catch a loon instead, because a loon's instinct is to strike at something if it flashes by it in the water. So once ingested, that lead, instead of being passed through, it's held in the stomach, and the, the uh, stones that are already in the stomach and the stomach acids dissolve that lead, and it, and it gets into the bloodstream, it gets into the tissues, and it leads to fatal lead poisoning of these birds. So the good news is that if that sinker or jig that's just been ingested is made of anything other than lead, and there's a huge number of things, you know, that we can make sinkers and jigs of. So there's steel, tin, tungsten, bismuth, stone, rubber, these new composite materials. Any of those a loon can swallow and chances are it'll be just fine. But the smallest little split shot that you can imagine, if a loon swallows, that um, uh, if it's made out of lead and a loon swallows it, it will kill that bird within two to four weeks of, of ingesting. So we are not asking folks to stop fishing, but we are saying, please go through those old tackle boxes, dust those off, open those up. If you're not sure whether that tackle is lead or not lead, I can almost guarantee you that it is lead. And we would love to exchange it for you. Caroline will be talking a little bit more about our lead tackle buyback program as, as well. Um, but this is just an early plug um, to, to please um, clean out those tackle boxes. And so, you know, back in 1975, people began to notice that uh, loons were becoming less common on New Hampshire's lakes. And the thinking was that if human activities had contributed to those declines, then human activities, if they were coordinated and thoughtful, could reduce those uh, declines and, and bring loons back uh, again to New Hampshire. That's the hope and the philosophy on which the Loon Preservation Committee was founded. Um, and this is where I'm going to stop my screen sharing and hand it over to Caroline to talk 
a little bit more about the Limb Preservation Committee and the work that we're trying to do to keep these birds common in the future. So I will stop that here. And Caroline, over to you. Great. Can you see my slides? We can. You can. Great. Um, let me go into presenter mode. Great. So Harry already covered the first part of this slide, so I'll just jump into, you know, what we are doing to help loons in New Hampshire. Um, and we are taking a sort of four-pronged approach that includes outreach and education, management, research, and then monitoring loons. Um, and so the outreach and education component of what we do includes talks like this. Uh, in a normal year, we would give about 100 or, you know, a little over 100 of these talks throughout the state at Rotary clubs or schools or lake association meetings just to help teach people about loons and how they can uh, use lakes in conjunction with loons um, and, you know, just share the water with them. In addition to those presentations, we have uh, a lot of other things that we, we do to help people learn more about loons. So every year we live stream two loon nests from start to finish uh, during the nesting season. And so people can watch the loons as they select their nest site and build their nest and lay their eggs, incubate for the 28 days, and then they get to see the chicks hatch. Um, and as we're doing this, we have our biologists go into the chat and interact with people, answer questions. Um, and so we found it to be a really great outreach tool. We're teaching people a lot about loons and we're also sharing a view into the life of the loons with them that don't get to see. And, you know, we catch some really cool things along the way. So we've got, uh, you know, this, this shot that the loon cam captured of a heron landing on top of the loon raft. Um, sorry. And then we get a really uh, intimate look into the hatching process. You can see the chicks pecking their way out of the eggs over the course of that 12 hours that they're hatching. Um, you see the first chick take its first swim and get its first meal and bond with the parents as the parents incubate the second egg. So it's a really, really um, great tool for us to teach people about these loons. In addition to that, we do these loon cruises on Squam Lake. So in this picture, you'll see our Squam Lakes biologist, Tiffany Grady. Um, and this is something that we do in partnership with the Squam Lakes Natural, uh, Squam Natural Science Center. Um, and they, they go around the lake. Tiffany teaches them about the specific loons of Squam and, you know, ways that they can help protect those loons. Uh, we also do a lot of management techniques. So on this slide, you'll see one of our loon rafts. This might be what we're, uh, you know, to the, the lay person on the lake, this might be what they know us for. Uh, these rafts really help to solve a lot of the problems that Harry mentioned earlier. So they rise and fall with lake levels so that if the water level raises, the nest isn't going to get flooded. And if the water level falls, it's not going to get stranded. Um, these rafts are also anchored a little bit offshore. So that doesn't totally, you know, make it so that predation isn't going to happen, but it makes it a little less likely because any of those predators will have to spend the extra effort to swim out to the raft. Um, and they also provide habitat on lakes where, you know, shoreline development might have gotten rid of all of the natural habitat. So um, in a given year in New Hampshire, and the long-term term average is that about one in four chicks hatched in the state is hatched off of these rafts. Ooh, sorry, I've got a little bit of delay in advancing my slides. Um, in addition to the rafts, we put out these signs, which uh, are meant to just make people aware of loon nests and give them an idea of how much space they should be giving those nests. So uh, <laughs> the sign you see here is one that we put out on the big lakes like Winnipesaukee. Um, it's a little bit more blunt, loon sanctuary keep out. On the smaller lakes, we have uh, more politely worded ones that say loon nesting sanctuary, please stay away. Um, and again, on really busy lakes, we might also put out the rope lines, which you can see coming off of the boat in this area. And that just adds a physical barrier so that in areas that do tend to get a lot of traffic, people, um, you know, just have a better idea of where they should and should not be going. In some cases, it's also necessary to put up signs on the shoreline. So these are photos of our Monadnock region biologist, Elena Batters, putting out signs on Spofford Lake. Um, so this is a lake where the nesting island has a lot of trails on it. It's part of a, natu a, nat uh, a state park. And so in addition to putting out the floating signs, Elena also roped off part of the 
uh, trail on the island just to try to give the loons a little bit more space. We're still waiting for that nest to hatch and we're hopeful. Um, and then as Harry said, we are doing a lead tackle buyback program to try to get that old lead tackle out of people's tackle boxes. Um, so at any of our participating retail shops, you can go there and if you turn in one ounce or more of illegal size lead tackle, you will be given a $10 voucher with which you can buy replacement tackle uh, or other fishing supplies. Um, and I'm just going to leave you on this list of uh, participating retailers for just a couple seconds and that way, uh, you know, if there's one nearby you, you can write it down and, and bring any tackle that you have. Um, and please, please, please reach out to your friends or family members or anyone that you know that fishes and just alert them to this problem of lead tackle and encourage them to dispose of it safely or participate in our buyback program. Another management thing that we do is loon rescues. So in a given year, we might do uh, up to 25 of these rescues. It really sort of varies by year. Um, but in general, the majority of the rescues we do are related to fishing activity. So loons that have lead poisoning, and unfortunately those rescues usually uh, do not end very positively um, because there's a very, very poor prognosis for a loon that has lead poisoning. Um, but in cases where the loon is tangled in fishing line, if we catch it early enough, usually those are, you know, they, once we release them back into the lake, they have a pretty, pretty good chance of coming back and continuing to breed. Um, and so this year, we've seen the return of two of the, the fishing line loons that we rescued last year, and both of them have produced chicks this year. So, um, you know, it's a management strategy that not only is saving the adult loon, but also helping to contribute to the future of the population. Um, and then we're also doing research. So looking into things like the causes of loon mortality. Um, so every dead loon that is reported to us, we collect and we necropsy it. A necropsy is just an animal autopsy. Um, and through that, we really are trying to just figure out what the threats to loons are. Necropsies are the reason that we know that lead poisoning was killing so many loons. Um, and so we continue to do that and we're you know, looking to make sure that we're not missing new and emerging threats to loons. Uh, other things that we're looking into include the effects of climate change on loon reproduction, effects of contaminants on loon reproduction, cyanotoxins in collaboration with UNH. So I know a couple people in the chat mentioned cyanotoxins, um, and we are working with uh, Jim Haney in the lab there to provide them data uh, on loons, including blood samples, so that they can look into that. Eggshell thickness, so uh, from every nest, uh, we collect either uh, failed eggs or egg shells and we archive those so that they can be used in future studies about thickness. Uh, effects on, of lead on loon survival and population growth rates. And causes of nest failure. And, and you know, we're looking into those causes of nest failure in the hopes that we can uh, develop management solutions to help address them. So here's a photo of our uh, vet intern from two summers ago, Kim Freed, who was doing a project with Jim Haney, um, looking at how cyanotoxins are showing up in fish, in plankton, and in loons on different lakes. Um, and then the final uh, portion of what we do is the monitoring. So I saved it for last, but it's definitely not least. Um, this is how we really figure out if our management tactics are working. We count loons, we count how many of the loons that are on our lakes form a pair, how many of those pairs actually nest in a given year, uh, how many of those nests are successful, how many chicks hatch, and how many chicks survive. Um, so we split the state into five monitoring regions, and then each of the big lakes, Umbagog, Squam, and Winnipesaukee, get their own biologist. And what we found is that since we began our work in 1975, the loon population in New Hampshire has more than tripled. And so it seems like our management uh, practices are working so far, but as you can see from the uh, carrying capacities shown on this graph, we still have a long way to go. And so, you know, we're eager to continue this work and expand it. And there are a lot of ways that people on the lakes can help us. So uh, I recognize a lot of the names of the participants in this talk from our volunteer list. Um, but there are also a lot of names that I didn't recognize. And so if any of you folks wanted to get involved with us, there are a lot of ways that you can do that. Um, 
you can help us build sign and rafts. Uh, and you can help us maintain and float those every year. You could help us with monitoring, you know, report your observations to us. Um, and, you know, there, there are a lot of other ways as well that we can sort of tailor to your interests. So if you are interested in volunteering with Loons in New Hampshire, please send me an email. Uh, you can reach me at volunteers at loon.org or call the Loon Center. Um, and with that, I guess we can open it up to questions. Wow, that was awesome. Uh, thank you, Harry and Caroline. And I've heard you both speak um, before. And again, I say this always, I always learn something new every time. So thank you. Uh, so in the house here, we have Crystal and Jessica who have been diligently managing the chat box and trying to respond to some of the questions. But I know there are a couple questions that they've reserved for the experts. So I'm going to turn it over to Crystal and Jessica. So go, go ahead. Well, uh, Harry and Caroline, I just want to say that that was an exceptional presentation. I'm absolutely blown away by how informative and well organized it was. And the pictures, wow, <laughs> they were really lovely. Um, and I know Thank that you. we lost the audio, but we, we heard from a couple of people in the chat boxes that they had their own loons. Uh, oh, outside, so that's, that's even better. <laughs> yeah, absolutely good. Okay, so I tried to write down uh, some of the questions. Um, people were concerned about wake boats and cyanobacteria, but I think that you both, uh, you know, address those in full over the course of the presentation. So I'm not sure that I'll ask those questions because I think you covered them. Um, people were also interested in loon calls. Um, and the variety of different loon calls and uh, if they use those calls that we observe to communicate specific things with one another, like if there is an eagle on the lake. Right, so sure, and, and Caroline, I guess I will, I will um, take this one, but, um, and sadly, I don't have my loon caller with me, but if folks want to go to loon.org, we have actual clips of each of those calls. So there are four, typical types of, of calls. It's the hoot and the, and the whale and the tremolo and the yodel. Um, and suffice it to, to say that each of those, because we're probably running close to the end of the time too, but each of those do have specific meanings. Um, many of them come in gradations and, and so loons can indicate um, what they're communicating, a level of motivation. Some of them have individual recognition characteristics, so we know that loons can actually recognize each other simply through their calls. Um, and so uh, together with all of these, the, the four different basic types of calls, the gradations and all the information that's contained in those calls, loons have really evolved a pretty complex and beautiful language. And, and of course, you know, they're not calling for our benefit, but we are the beneficiaries of hearing those calls in, in the night. So I would encourage folks to go to loon.org. We have a special section entirely on loon calls because that is the way so many people have, um, have learned to uh, appreciate loons and first were drawn in, you know, to loons as well by hearing those calls in the night. So I'll, uh, I'll ask folks to go on to loon.org. Thanks, Harry. Uh, and, and I'll say loon.org is a wonderful website. I spend a lot of time on there myself. Um, and uh, you folks do a really wonderful job maintaining the information and making it visually pleasant to interact with. Uh, so everybody should go to loon.org. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Crystal. You're nice to you're nice to say that. Um, and because Caroline worked really hard to do a total overhaul and and redo of our of our webpage. So um, thank you for the nice comment. Well, Caroline, amazing job. Um, <laughs> Jessica, you. do you want to ask a question? Sure. Um, we had one just come in about how many pounds of fish does an adult loon eat daily, and does it vary at the time of the year um, and increase when they're feeding their young? Caroline? Yeah, so um, the only study I'm aware of that looked at that was from Canada back in 1995. It was a Jack Barr study, and I believe they said about two pounds per day per adult loon, um, and something like 900, 950 pounds for a family with two chicks over the course of a breeding season. Um, so that, you know, and it, it could vary by region, but that's sort of the only number that I'm aware of. Yeah. 
Awesome. And, and Jessica, we, I, we should mention as well that these aren't, you know, the beautiful trout that these loons are going after again. These are the little, the little panfish, right? The little minnows and, and things that loons are, are eating. So they're not fishing out our lakes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's um, a good point. Um, two, two things real quick. Someone asked if you could repeat the email um, to touch base with you guys. Um, and also, is, is it available to request a floating nest? How would someone go about getting that on their lake or is there an option for that? Yeah, so um, part of what I didn't mention when talking about the floating rafts is that we do have some pretty specific criteria for where we put them out. Um, just because if a loon can nest successfully on a lake, naturally, we want them to do that. Um, and, you know, a given pair in a given year isn't necessarily always going to succeed. The average loons in New Hampshire raise one chick to fledging every other year. So, uh, one bad year for nesting doesn't necessarily mean that a raft is needed. It could just mean that the loons had an off year. And so because of that, we really only put out rafts on lakes where the loons have, their natural nest has failed for at least three years. Um, and so if you believe your, your lake meets that criteria, you can email us. Um, and the email to use there would be info at loon.org, or you could give us a call and you know we can put you in touch with our biologist staff to talk about uh, whether the lake meets the specific requirements. Um, and then in regards to the email address that you can use to get more involved with our work, that's volunteers at loon.org. And I can also put that in the chat if that's helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, I have, well, we have a couple questions that um, came in about, you know, loon health. One was if lead used in the ocean is a threat to loons as well. And, and I had been under the assumption, and it could be wrong, that uh, there's something about the size of um, the jigs and stuff that are used on the ocean that are too big for loons to eat. Is that a myth? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and no, Crystal, you've got it right. I mean, oh, cool. typically, um, the, uh, the oceans are, are more buoyant, there's strong currents and things. So we're typically using um, sinkers that are over an ounce in size. And it's very rare that we get a loon that swallows a sinker or a jig that's more than an ounce in, in weight. Uh, not to say that it doesn't happen. And we have actually gotten loons off the ocean. I think that the record was four, maybe approaching five ounces. This is a huge jig, you know, that was swallowed by a loon. Um, but, but the vast majority of loons, freshwater in, in a breeding situation, if they have swallowed a sinker or, or a jig, it, it very, it most often, not entirely, but it most often falls into that one ounce or less size. So okay. we think that that's a protective standard, you know, for, um, for uh, the vast majority of, of instances um, in which a loon is likely to swallow down. And it's the best that we could get from the legislature, right? So that's the <laughs> reason why we, we have done that. But we actually do think it's pretty good, good. to solve uh, legislation. That's, that's hard to accomplish, so uh, we're all be, happy to right? hear that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you okay. to New Hampshire Lakes for helping us with that, yeah. Well, Tom, Tom O'Brien is in the audience tonight, so good. thanks, Tom. Um, uh, a couple of questions about uh, loons in trouble. Um, you folks do rescues every year. Uh, if somebody witnesses an adult or a chick uh, that they think is in trouble, do they reach out to you? And how? <laughs> yeah, so the fastest way will be to give us a call. Um, and you can, you know, our, our phone number is on our website, but I can also say it here. It's 603 Four seven six five six six six, and you can remember that because it's four seven six loon. Um, oh, cool! Yeah. So if if it's during uh, working hours nine to five, the fastest way to get in touch with us and get a response will be to call. If it's after hours, we do have a report a loon in distress form on our website under contact, and so that gets sent to the biologist staff. And usually, we're checking our email at least once before bed. So if it's after five, we should be able to get back to you within the same night. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, and now, you know, everybody is always sad when this happens, but uh, if, a, if a, a loon egg doesn't hatch on your lake, um, is there a way to send that to you to have it studied to get that necropsy done on it? Yeah, so we do collect all, um, 
all unhatched loon eggs. We do have a very specific protocol for collecting them in New Hampshire because we want to make sure that they actually have been abandoned. Um, and because of our permitting with Fish and Game, usually it has to be an LPC staff member that goes out and does the actual collection of the, loo uh, the egg, again, to make sure that we followed those protocols and we know it's definitely failed and not going to hatch. Um, but if you do have what you believe is an abandoned loon egg, definitely give us a call and we'll have a biologist come out and check it out. Okay. All right. Jessica, do you have any that, uh, that we missed? Or if anybody has questions that we missed, um, it's eight o'clock, but feel free to shoot them in really, really quick and we'll try and squeeze them <laughs> in. Well, there is a question about regu regulatory compliance. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I wonder, Crystal, I can say a few things on that. Yeah. And um, the question was, you know, how do we deal with weak uh, enforcement of keeping the shoreline healthy? Um, you know, loons, you know, are, as Caroline and, and Harry talked about, shoreland um, uh, degradation is another threat to them. And so here in New Hampshire, many of you are familiar, we have the, um, an a, a law um, which regulates, you know, what happens within 250 feet of the water, which does encourage um, vegetation along the shoreline. Um, but, you know, really what it comes down to and what we, New Hampshire Lakes, are trying to do through our Lake Smart Lake Friendly Living Program is really trying to encourage people to um, maintain or improve their shoreline so that they're more lake friendly, which is going to benefit wildlife as a whole. So loons, fish, you know, the whole, the whole ecosystem. So, um, you know, that program, we're just kicking that off. And I know a few folks in the audience here have participated in our Lake Smart program. And, and soon, Caroline and Harry, we would love to meet with LPC, um, you know, after whenever we're not busy, right, and talk about how um, maybe some sort of, uh, you know, it's the Lake Smart program, but how we might incorporate um, some standards to be more protective of loons as well. Um, we do talk about in that program, you know, um, you know, what you use for fishing and things like that, but we'd like to, to compare notes to figure out, you know, what what else that we might be able to do through that program to help increase the naturalness of our shorelines, which we know the, le the loons really benefit from. Yeah, absolutely, Andrea, in so many ways, right? You know, so, I mean, we would all much rather see a loon nesting on a piece of natural shoreline that's been conserved rather than on a raft, you know, that's been floated by the Loon Preservation Committee. And so we, we view these rafts as a Band-Aid solution long-term. We would like to have fewer rafts out there and mm -hmm. more conserved areas of, of shoreline because that does benefit loons. It benefits other species, you know, the moose that wants to come down to the lake and have a sip of water and, or browse a, a little bit and, and go up again. Um, it, it, keeps, it keeps the phosphorus out of our lakes. It keeps contaminants, you know, from flushing into our, our lakes. So there's so many, um, there, there are so many benefits and, and advantages to keeping those natural shorelines. And it's just one more area where LPC and, and New Hampshire lakes, you know, our, our objectives combine. Absolutely. Well, this has been wonderful. I know folks, um, there's few, few unanswered questions in the chat box, but we'll try and track down some of that information and get it out with our, um, you know, correspondence that comes out after this. Um, so I would wanted to thank you all for tuning in and spending this lovely evening with, with us. Um, Caroline and Harry, I can't thank you enough. I know this is a super busy time of year for you and Caroline just returned from being up north. Um, so thank you for making the time for us. Those of you who are on the call, um, again, in about 15 minutes, you're gonna get an evaluation request from us. So let us know how we did. Tomorrow, you'll get an email with a link to this webinar recording and heads up, you'll soon hear about our next webinar series. And it sounds like we could have Caroline and Harry both back and maybe some of your other team members back at some point for another wonderful topic about loons. So before we sign off, Caroline and Harry, um, is there anything else you wanted to, to add or, or say to, to our folks tonight? You know, I, I just wanted to say thanks everybody for tuning in and, and uh, letting us talk about loons and the work of the Loon Preservation Committee. And, and thank you for having this series and inviting us to speak. Awesome. 
All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Be well and, and keep up the good work and spread this news, the things you learned tonight to someone who wasn't here tonight. Just help us spread the word. And we're relying on, on you folks to, to help people know what needs to be done. So thank you. And good night. Good, good night.